Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. Coming up on the program, Brian Lynn reports on humpback whale songs. Jill Robbins has a story on Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Faith Perlow explains the difference between the words disturbing and irritating. Later, we listen to part three of *The Blue Hotel* by Stephen Crane. But first, a new study suggests the singing noises made by humpback whales might be a sign of loneliness. Scientists who recorded humpback whale behavior in Australia discovered that fewer whales made the singing noises, also called wailing, as their population grew. Humpback whale song is loud and travels far in the ocean, said marine biologist Rebecca Dunlop of the University of Queensland. In Brisbane, she has long studied humpback whales and helped lead the new study. Her work has centered on humpbacks that reproduce near Australia's Great Barrier Reef. Dunlop told the Associated Press she made an unexpected find as whale numbers sharply rose following the end of commercial whaling. It was getting more difficult to actually find singers, she said. Dunlop added, "When there were fewer of them, there was a lot of singing. Now that there are lots of them." No need to be singing so much. Scientists first began to hear and study the complex songs of the humpback whales in the 1970s. They used underwater microphones to do so. Only male whales sing. Scientists think the whales sing to seek mates or show power. Eastern Australia's humpback whales came close to disappearing in the 1960s, when their number dropped to around 200. But over time, the population began to regrow, climbing to about 27,000 whales by 2015. That number is near estimated pre-whaling levels. As the density of whales increased, their singing behaviors changed. While two in ten males made wailing noises in 2004, ten years later the number had dropped to one in ten. Dunlop said, "The team's study appeared in a recent issue of Nature Communications Biology." Dunlop said she thinks singing played a big part in bringing in mates when populations were severely reduced. It was hard just to find other whales in the area because there weren't many. She added, "When humpbacks live in denser populations, males looking for mates also have to deal with competing whales." Dunlop explained the singing noises might bring in other possible mates. Boris Worm is an ocean biologist at Canada's Dalhousie University. He was not involved in the research. As animal populations recover, they change their behavior. They have different constraints, Worm said. The research suggests the seas are still noisy with humpback whale sounds. 
Many humpbacks seek to bring in mates with a combination of singing and physical movements. The study notes. The large increase in the humpback population during the study period provided valuable data about changes in the animal's behavior, said Simon Ingram. He studies humpback whales at the University of Plymouth in Britain. Ingram said humpback whales must have been singers long before whaling reduced their numbers. But the new study demonstrates how necessary their complex and beautiful songs were to their survival and recovery, he added. Clearly, singing became incredibly valuable when their numbers were very low, Ingram said. Ludwig van Beethoven has long been considered one of the greatest composers of classical music. Critics say that his final complete musical work, the Ninth Symphony, is possibly his best. The symphony was first performed on May 7, 1824, in Vienna, Austria. Beethoven already had lost his hearing when he was composing the Ninth. He never fully heard the performance himself. And nearly two hundred years after the first performance, there is still disagreement over how fast the work should be performed. Benjamin Zander is the music director of the Boston Philharmonic, a classical music performance group he founded in 1979. The nearly 84-year-old conductor is leading the Boston Philharmonic in a performance on Friday night at Boston's Symphony Hall. Then, on Sunday afternoon, he will do the same at New York's Carnegie Hall. Zander believes that Beethoven's Ninth Symphony should sound far different than the way it is usually performed. He plans to finish the symphony in less than one hour during the performances in Boston and New York. There is so much information from Beethoven and so little information about how to interpret it, Zander told the Associated Press. Zander said he sought advice from violinist and scholar Rudolf Kolisch. In the 1993 issue of the Musical Quarterly, Kolisch discussed how Beethoven marked his work using a metronome, a device that produces a steady beat to help musicians with the speed or tempo, of musical work. Beethoven wrote in an 1817 letter that he wanted to drop musical terms like allegro for fast, andante for slow, or presto for extremely fast. He added, the metronome gives us the best opportunity to do so. In 1992, Zander's recording with the Boston Philharmonic for the music company Pickwick International, came in at 57 minutes, 51 seconds. His 2018 recording of the same music was 58 minutes, 39 seconds long. For the recording, I really set out to be a devoted servant, Zander said. He said he had a little statue of Beethoven and looked at it from time to time to see if it was smiling. Some of the world's most famous conductors, however, took more time with Beethoven's Ninth in their performances. Arturo Toscanini took 65 minutes for RCA Victor with the NBC Symphony Orchestra at Carnegie Hall in 1952. Wilhelm Furtwangler needed 74 minutes at the Bayreuth Festival in 1951. And Leonard Bernstein stretched the music for 78 minutes during his 1989 performance with members of six orchestras to mark the fall of the Berlin Wall. After Zander's performance at Carnegie Hall on October 10, 1983, Andrew Porter wrote in The New Yorker, 
If Mr. Zander is right, we have been hearing the music of the greatest composer only in misrepresentation. Many conductors noted Beethoven's loss of hearing as a reason to ignore his metronome markings. James Conlon is the music director of the Los Angeles Opera and main conductor of Italy's Orchestra Rai. He said, There are powerful arguments on both sides. I am not against performing Beethoven at the speeds suggested by the metronome. He added that if the resulting performance lacks expression, emotion, and dynamics, then it should not be followed. Andrew Price regularly plays oboe with several orchestras in Boston. He said, The hardest thing is just to keep an open mind about it. All the stuff I learned as a 20-year-old student, I had to go back and relearn it all, just to have a completely different approach. Hello. This week on Ask a Teacher, we will answer a question about the difference between disturbing and irritating. Hi, VOA Learning English. My name is Hamza, and I am from Algeria. I have been learning English using your programs for several years. My question is, what is the difference between the words disturbing and irritating? Thank you, Hamza. Dear Hamza, thank you for writing to us. Both of these adjectives come from verbs. Both words can describe being upset or upsetting someone, but the emotions these words describe can be quite different. Let's look at each word more closely so we can identify the emotions behind them. Let's start with disturbing. Disturbing is an adjective that comes from the verb disturb. It means that something causes worry or upsets you. Methane gases are disturbing because they are said to trap more heat in the atmosphere than carbon dioxide. If something is disturbing, it bothers you and makes you feel bad or is creepy. I hate watching horror movies because they are so disturbing. As a verb, disturb means to bother or interrupt someone so that they become upset by your actions. Please be quiet in the library so you don't disturb others. And lastly, as a verb, disturb means to change something's position, shape, or to put it in disorder. My sister disturbed my clothes when she borrowed a shirt from my closet. They were a mess the next day. Let's move on to irritating. Just like disturbing, irritating is an adjective that comes from a verb. It can also describe something that makes you upset. But instead of feelings of worry or fear, something that is irritating causes you to feel annoyed or frustrated. Bugs flying near my head are irritating. My next-door neighbor is so loud. Her voice is irritating. Irritate as a verb can mean to annoy, but it also has a medical meaning, to cause itching or soreness. Devon has allergies, which always irritate her eyes, making her cry and sneeze. Please let us know if these explanations and examples have helped you. What question do you have about American English? Send us an email at 
learning English at voanews.com. And that's Ask a Teacher. You just heard Faith Perlow present this week's Ask a Teacher. Welcome back, Faith. Hi, Dan. Today you looked at some fun words, disturbing and irritating. We have a lot of synonyms for disturbing, don't we? There sure are a lot of synonyms. Something that's disturbing can also be perturbing, troubling, concerning, distressing, or disquieting. Each word with their own level of emotion and negativity. In the story, you talked about how horror movies can be disturbing. Have you seen any good scary movies lately? I don't really watch horror movies for the fact that most involve death, and that's quite disturbing. Um, I did watch The Menu recently. That was more of a thriller than horror. Uh, it was about a young couple who go to a fancy restaurant, and uh, let's just say that the chef prepares their last meal. What about you, Dan? I actually do really enjoy horror movies. I haven't seen any good new ones, but the best horror movie I've seen in recent memory is called Hereditary, which came out a few years ago. It's about a family that's haunted by their dead grandmother, who led an evil cult. And I also recently read Carrie by Stephen King. Carrie is about a girl who is bullied in school and takes revenge on her classmates in, uh, bloody ways. I guess I like to be disturbed sometimes in books and movies. I remember Carrie. I forgot that Stephen King wrote that. I'd recommend The Menu, or if you like zombie sci-fi stuff, The Last of Us is a great show. That's what I'm more into. Ah yes, The Last of Us. I've been watching it. It is very creepy. Well, thanks for coming on the show, Faith. The men prepared to go out. The Easterner was so nervous that he had great difficulty putting on his new leather coat. As the cowboy pulled his fur cap down over his ears, his hands trembled. In fact, Johnny and Old Scully were the only ones who displayed no emotion. No words were spoken during these proceedings. Scully threw open the door. Instantly, a wild wind caused the flame of the lamp to struggle for its life. The men lowered their heads and pushed out into the cold. No snow was falling, but great clouds of it swept up from the ground by the fierce winds were streaming all around. The covered land was a deep blue, and there was no other color except one light shining from the low, black railroad station. It looked like a tiny jewel. The Swede was calling out something. Scully went to him, put a hand on his shoulder, and indicated an ear. What did you say? I said... Screamed the Swede again. I won't have a chance against this crowd. I know you'll all jump on me. No, no, man, called Scully. But the wind tore the words from his lips and scattered them far. The Swedes shouted a curse, but the storm also seized the remainder of the sentence. The men turned their backs upon the wind and walked to the shelter side of the hotel. Here, a V-shaped piece of icy grass had not been covered by the snow. When they reached the spot, it was heard that the Swede was still screaming. Oh, I know what kind of a thing this is. I know you'll jump on me. I can't beat you all. Scully turned on him angrily. You won't have to beat all of us. You'll have to beat my son Johnny. And the man that troubles you during that time... We'll have to deal with me. The arrangements were quickly made. The two men faced each other, obeying the short commands of Scully. The Easterner was already cold, and he was jumping up and down. 
the Cowboys stood rock-like. The fighters had not removed any clothing. Their hands were ready, and they eyed each other in a calm way that had the elements of fierce cruelty in it. Now, said Scully. The two leaped forward and struck together like oxen. There was heard the dull sound of blows and of a curse pressed out between the tight teeth of one. As for the watchers, the Easterners held in breath burst from him in relief, pure relief after the anxious waiting. The cowboy leaped into the air with a scream. Scully stood unmoving, as if in complete surprise and fear at the fierceness of the fight which he himself had permitted and arranged. For a time, the fight in the darkness was such a scene of flying arms that it showed no more detail than a moving will. Sometimes a face would shine out, frightful and marked with pink spots. A moment later, the men would be only shadows. Suddenly, the cowboy was caught by warlike desires, and he leaped forward with the speed of a wild horse. Hit him, Johnny! Hit him! Kill him! Kill him! Keep still, said Scully, icily. Then there was a sudden loud sound, dull, incomplete, cut short. Johnny's body fell away from the Swede, with sickening heaviness to the grass. The cowboy hardly had time to prevent the mad Swede from throwing himself upon the fallen body. Scully was at his son's side. Johnny, Johnny, my boy. His voice had a quality of sad tenderness. Johnny, can you fight some more? He looked anxiously down into the bloody, beaten face of his son. There was a moment of silence. And then Johnny answered in his ordinary voice, Yes, I... it... yes. Helped by his father, he struggled to his feet. Wait a minute now till you get your breath, said the old man. A few steps away, the cowboy was telling the Swede. No, you don't. Wait a second. The Easterner was pulling at Scully's arm. Oh, this is enough, he begged. This is enough. Let it go as it is. This is enough. Bill, said Scully. Get out of the way. The cowboy stepped aside. Now. The fighters advanced toward each other. Then the Swede aimed a lightning blow that carried with it his entire weight. Johnny, though faint from weakness, luckily stepped aside and the unbalanced Swede fell to the ground. The cowboy, Scully, and the Easterner cheered. But before its finish, the Swede was up and attacking his enemy madly. There were more wildly moving arms, and Johnny's body again fell away like a stone. The Swede quickly struggled to a little tree and leaned upon it, breathing hard while his fierce and flame-lit eyes wandered from face to face as the men bent over Johnny. Can you still fight, Johnny? asked Scully in a voice of despair. After a moment, the son answered. No, I can't fight anymore. Then, from shame and bodily ill, he began to weep the tears pouring down through the blood on his face. He was too, too, too heavy for me. Scully straightened and spoke to the waiting figure. Stranger, he said calmly. We're finished. Then his voice changed into that deep and quiet tone, which is the tone of the most simple and deadly announcements. Johnny is beaten. Without replying, 
the winner moved away to the door of the hotel. The others raised Johnny from the ground, and as soon as he was on his feet, he refused all attempts at help. When the group came around the corner, they were almost blinded by the blowing snow. It burned their faces like fire. The cowboy carried Johnny through the piles of snow to the door. Inside, they were greeted by a warm stove and women who took Johnny to the kitchen. The three others sat around the heat, and the sad quiet was broken only by the sounds overhead when the Swede moved about in his room. Soon they heard him on the stairs. He threw the door open and walked straight to the middle of the room. No one looked at him. Well, he said loudly to Scully, I suppose you'll tell me now how much I owe you. The old man, with a dull expression, remained calm. You don't owe me anything. Mr. Scully, called the Swede again, how much do I owe you? He was dressed to go, and he had his bag in his hand. You don't owe me anything, repeated Scully in the same unmoved way. I guess you're right. I guess the truth would be that you would owe me something. That's what I guess. He turned to the cowboy. Kill him! Kill him! Kill him! He repeated in the tone the cowboy had used. Then he laughed. But he might have been laughing at the dead. The three men did not move or speak, just stared with glassy eyes at the stove. The Swede opened the door and passed into the storm, giving one last glance at the still group.